have a pretty diverse background. So I go anywhere from hippie, herbal, and acupuncture, energetics, all the way through pretty hardcore science and uh, molecular chemistry. And I think that my belief system in medicine and healing is that they're all true, they're all valid, and they all have their place, depending on what aspect of our body, mind, or spirit we're looking at uh, uh, working with. So, you know, when, when, we, when we discussed what I was going to talk about, what things make me feel happy and passionate to talk about, seasonal, uh, lectures are always things that I really love doing. When I used to teach yoga, I would teach yoga for the season, you know, and, and I love talking about diet for the season um, because all of the ancient medical systems, and, you know, this is something that's kind of lost in modern medicine, um, although you will see uh, occasionally, you know, you'll talk, we'll, we'll talk about eat locally, eat seasonally, you know, in the, in the natural food industry, but in, in medicine, it's sort of left out. The ancient systems of medicine be living in and working with nature were you know completely linked there's no such thing as separating the two so i thought that it would be neat to start out today with just talking about a very old textbook that's uh, probably 2000 almost 2000 years old and it's one of the foundational texts of asian medicine uh, in china uh, called the huang di nei jing and the, this is almost treated nowadays in modern uh, Chinese medicine as a, as a scriptural, you know, a landmark text that people will still quote and still use. You have to study it at every, in every acupuncture program. Um, so the person, this book is basically a dialogue between a guy named Chibo uh, and, the, and his, his teacher, his uh, medical teacher, and he's trying to impart the wisdom of medicine to the student. Um, and the teacher says, or the, the question is, how do how does disease come about? And the teacher says, disease comes about basically because humans start to live out of harmony with the environment. We don't wake up with the sun and go to bed with the sun. We don't change our lifestyle based on the weather, based on the wind, the cold, the snow, the heat. And we don't change our diet based on these things. So because of not living in harmony, diseases start to stir within the human body um, and organ dis become disrupted. So um, I'm going to, let's see, I don't need, think I need to share this, but basically the, the seasons and, and Chinese medicine talks about a lot about five element theory. So I wanna start with that. And in, I'm gonna draw a picture in a few minutes and with my terrible handwriting, and we can kind of have a schemat for uh, how we look at flavors actually, and correspondences with the foods that we eat. So it's said that the autumn, you know, the season we're in right now is the season of ripening. It's cool, the wind blows fast and the atmosphere is clear. We should go to sleep early, get up at dawn, just like the rooster. These are, this is from the text. We should keep our minds at peace and calm uh, and calm the effect of autumn's cool weather on the body, moderate our mental activities and balance the autumn energy to avoid um, feelings that things that disrupt the lungs. So in this passage, essentially, he's talking about the link between the fall and the weakness of the lungs. So that's the first thing. Then the next season, of course, we have winter coming up. Winter is the season for storage. Water freezes and earth cracks. Care must be taken to avoid disturbing the yang qi, which is the, the yang qi is sort of the metabolism of the body. Um, and it goes on to say, people should go to sleep early, get up late when the sun is shining. Mentally maintain quiet, just like when keeping a secret. We should avoid the cold, try to keep warm, avoid sweating as to prevent loss of the energy. When we talk about basic health and basic workings of nature and how they relate to our body, we talk about five elements. So bear with me, There's fire, metal, whoops, I'm going ahead of myself, water, and wood. This is the Chinese model, and it's just a paradigm for understanding nature. And obviously, I'm, this, is, this by itself is a lecture that when I teach in the herbal medicine school, this is uh, about 10 hours of lecture to understand the basics of this model. So we're just going into a couple really small aspects of it just for what we have to talk about today and understanding translating this into diet. So metal is the, is, represents, the, this is all the cycle of, of the season. So we go from fall metal and winter is over here. 
is going to give you a basic correspondences to start out for that have been mapped out in the Chinese text. And then there's some flavors that go along with them, of course, and some organs. So metal is the lungs. <laughs> I'm running out of room. Winter. Uh, let's see, I'm going to go up here and talk about earth element, which will be the spleen. Well, let's, let's call it GI, actually. Let's call it GI to make it a little simpler. So the, the whole digestive tract. And then we have a couple flavors that we'll put in here. So the flavor of earth is sweet. Uh, flavor of metal is pungent. Um, and those are the those are the ones I want to concentrate on. So obviously this is a big model and it's co correspondence is everywhere. So the theory is if we are now in fall, we are preparing to nourish for the water element, which comes next to, to prevent our, ourselves from getting sick from the winter, which is cold and, and the water, if you think about the water element as really as water turning into ice in the winter. So what we do, the circle is kind of a, co a collection of relationships of which element generates the next. So if we want to make our lungs strong, I wish I had colors, we start by nourishing the earth. Um, and we nourish the element of metal as well. So we want to work on putting sweet and pungent flavored things on our diet. That's the old Chinese theory, okay? So this basic model, and I, I really do wish that I could, maybe one day we could do a whole workshop just, workshop just on understanding how to analyze our lives just from the five element perspective. Sure. Um, but uh, this is basically the ancient Chinese way of saying, if you follow this and, and, and look at this model, you can bring yourself back into balance for that particular season. Or, or, and there's obviously, there's many other correspondences that have been mapped out over time, like emotional correspondences, for example, and uh, herbal correspondence. So it keeps going on and on and on later. So in, uh, now we get back to just botany. Okay, basic principles of botany. Um, has everybody heard of dandelion? That one's a pretty good one. Everybody knows what dandelions look like. They're a you know, wide, herbaceous plant that grow yellow flowers that most people hate in their lawn and want to try to get rid of and spray toxic chemicals on. Well, for, for us herbalists, those are some of our most important medicines and actually foods. So dandelion root, dandelion flower, and dandelion leaf, three different major parts of the plant all have medicinal aspects to them. Um, and this is a wonderful uh, plant that we can tincture and use each of the parts for different things. Uh, when you tincture them, you're putting them in alcohol and preserving the medicine of the plant essentially so that you could use it all year round. But good herbalists know that different parts of the plant should be harvested at different times of the year. So right now, um, it, or maybe a little bit later, um, once the green part starts to die back, the root is more active. And this is obviously true with any plant. So in the fall, it, the best time to harvest roots uh, is the fall. And then later on in the spring, when the, the greens are up and really lush um, and young and tender before they get really tough in the summer, that's the best time to harvest the leaves. So um, the most of the chemicals of the plant go into those parts of the, of the plant at that particular season. So one you know, very ancient dietary concept for eating seasonally in the fall is really eating a high root vegetable content diet. That's one kind of basic principle. Now, you know, of course, at suppers, you know, our, the organization def definitely doesn't want us to eat a very high glycemic diet, right? So that's a, that's a big principle. Having potatoes all day long is not the answer to that, but there are plenty of other vegetables that are root vegetables that are not as high glycemic. So of course you think of parsnips and turnips and, and celery root and all these other things, and you can still harmonize with the nat with nature as it's intended and reap the benefits of lots of great nourishing plant phytochemicals. And many of those chemicals that are in root vegetables, so now we're gonna, I can start to st branch out to the more sciencey side of nutrition. Many of those chemicals are immune modulating polysaccharides. So that's a bunch of big words for saying long sugars. Now, by sugars, they don't necessarily mean sugar like uh, they're plant sugars, not necessarily the thing in your, you know, in your that you put in your coffee. Um, but their their beta glucans are actually some of them that are a, a, a class of chemicals that are between a sugar and a carbohydrate that have medicinal compounds that directly have research showing that it can modulate immune function. So some of these beta glucans can stimulate white cells. T cells, um, 
and on and on and on. Actually, the research has been pretty prolific on these compounds. Um, so if you feel so inclined and you like science and more molecular science, go look up beta 1,3 glucan. Um, that's one of the nerdy topics you could look up. So it's uh, beta, usually it's beta and then 1, 3 glucan, G-L-U-C-A-N. Now, I mentioned that because those are just really common in certain root, roots. But another big uh, class of uh, plants that have these beta-glucans, and that's where all the original research was, are medicinal mushrooms. So did you ever wonder why thanks to, you know, the quintessential Thanksgiving meal has some sort of mushroom dish? You know, you, we always see that in popular American culture. There's, there's mushrooms in the green bean casserole, right? That, that's something that you'll see in a lot of uh, families' households. You'll always see lots of sweet potatoes, carrots, yams, all the root vegetables. Um, and I certainly love making roasted root vegetables like that. Um, but the mushrooms, originally the beta-glucans were isolated out of something called reishi mushroom, which is a, one of the, you know, the king or the queen herb of, of Asian medicine. And originally really good reishi mushrooms were reserved thousands of years ago for the emperor because they were, they were hard to come by the really good quality ones. Um, so all of the research out there is often done on reishi mushroom, R-E-I-S-H-I. -I. So if that's something you're interested in reading about, that would be the word you would, you could Google search. Um, however, there are other mushrooms that are, that are, you know, commonly found, um, that we could find at Whole Earth and Whole Foods and start using in our food. Uh, shiitake and maitake are two that are, are pretty big in my diet whenever I can get a hold of them. Uh, especially, I love my takis. Uh, they're they're a little more seasonal, but now is the season, so you should start to see them. Typically, when I make my you know healthy version of Thanksgiving green bean casserole to bring, mine is full of my taki mushrooms, and I probably spent a, short, a small fortune. I wonder if my family uh, appreciates it. But I know that by using this, I'm putting in a medicinal herb in there, an ingredient that's going to help nourish and show love with my family by helping their immune system. So. Uh, so one thing that I think is really important, especially given that it's gonna start getting cold, is um, my what I make a mushroom soup essentially uh, for immune function. So the an, an immune mushroom soup, I usually do it like a miso. And the recipe is fairly simple and incredibly forgiving. So for those of you who don't necessarily love to cook, uh, you can't get it wrong. That's, that's the nice part. Basically in my true Italian fashion with no with lack of measurements, what I do is I take the biggest pot I have in the house. I fill it with really good quality, you know, uh, filtered reverse osmosis water. And I get a big handful of mushrooms. That's how I measure them like that. <laughs> um, so basically it's really whatever you can get your hands on. So uh, maitake and shiitake are absolutely my preference, but there are medicinal benefits to most mushrooms. But with that said, something like white button mushrooms and, you know, portobellos are really famous and popular. Unfortunately, they're not as very as nutritionally dense, especially since most of them are bred for how they taste and not necessarily the, the compounds that are in, in them that are nutritional. So I would say make your medicinal broth, especially if you're looking for flu prevention and, and immune boosting out of the maitakis and shiitakes. So what I do is I put them in a food processor to chop them up as small as I can get them, because if you increase the surface area, uh, um, that it is exposed to the water, you get a better extraction. Now, the thing that people don't realize with the medicinal mushrooms that's very crucial actually, is that you're not cooking them like a regular food. The temperature has to be really low and they cook for a very long time. So in an ideal world, this might be something you would do on a Saturday. You start it as soon as you get up and you finish cooking it at night. And then you have a couple days worth um, of this wonderful uh, broth. So the ideal cooking temperature is actually between 140 and 160. If you really wanna get fancy, you can put a candy thermometer in the water and try to keep it at that temperature. Um, of course, throughout the day, you would have to add more water um, because it will evaporate quite a bit over, you know, a good many hour cooking process. I would say if I'm going to make this, my minimum cooking time is four hours. Uh, really, anything under that is kind of not, not going to make anything that's really uh, as nourishing as, as it could be. Uh, but if I could leave it on for a 12 hour period, I would, I would do that uh, uh, most of the time. That's what I do. It's just like I'm making many of my herbal broths. Um, 
if you don't want to do it with a thermometer, you could really easily just put it on the stove and you basically have one bubble at the pot at the top at all times. That's essentially what you're looking for. That's, that's how you know you're in. You're not really going to boil it. If you boil it too hot, the polysaccharides break down and then the medicinal um, aspects are not as strong. Um, a slow cooker. Oh, hi, Karen. <laughs> uh, slow cooker, you know, it depends on the temperature, like a crock pot, the lower setting is, I think, over 160. So it's not bad, you're still going to get medicinal uh, compounds out, but it may start to get too hot. And then you're boiling down the sugars in a way that breaks them down. And now they're kind of inert. So I, you, I would say just, you know, if you're not sure of what temperature, if it's not in uh, like a digital control, use the thermometer. Um, I, I have a gas stove. I love my gas stove. I, I hate electric. I grew up on a gas stove and I know I can control my temperature really well with that. So I have no problem just leaving it on the flame all day. Also, I have no little children and small pets that uh, could be dangerous around a stove that's on. So that, that's something to keep in mind. So what I do with this broth, basically I take a sheet of kelp um, and a whole bunch of mushrooms. So kelp you can get in any of these stores. Uh, the reason for kelp is a couple fold. One, because it adds salty flavor, which I apologize, I didn't add that into my five element star, but salt, salty flavored things are the element of water, which is the winter element. So by keeping some amount of salt flavor in the food, you're nourishing that aspect for winter. Um, but when the Chinese were talking about salty, they weren't actually talking about the white stuff in the shaker. They were talking about mineral rich herbs that gives you a salt flavor on your tongue. So if you just boil kelp for a couple of hours in water, taste it, you taste salt, partially because there is some salt from the ocean, but you're also getting a wide array of trace minerals. So we're essentially making miso broth. So you put a sheet of kelp, you know, a good pound or so of those mushrooms, let it cook all day as much as you can. There's another herb that you can get fairly easily. Whole Earth does have it, have it in bulk called astragalus root. So I usually stick some astragalus root in there. Um, they come like they look almost like tongue depressors. And I put, if I'm making a, let's say my pot is an eight quart pot. So I would put about 10 of those tongue depressors in the water and let that cook as well. Astragalus has a ton and ton and ton of research for uh, stimulating white blood cells and immune function in many different ways. So that's certainly wonderful to add into the soup. Um, and then I also throw in a couple leeks. Um, leeks are wonderful specifically because they're rich in something called inulin. And inulin is a prebiotic food that the microbiome, the bacteria in our intestines basically feed off of. And my teacher calls it miracle grow for the intestinal flora. And as we might, you may or may not know in, in nutritional concepts, if your micro, uh, microbiome, your intestinal bacteria are off, your immune system doesn't stand a good chance at, be, at functioning optimally. So this is why the probiotic craze kind of happened in the US and now around the world. So, um, so you throw some leaks in there and you're gonna get a lot of those also, those compounds that nourish the gut flora. Downside to this, if you overdo it, it can make you gassy because that's the sign of the probiotic flora coming alive in the intestines. So you have to know what your dose is for something like a leak. If you could eat a little bit of the soup or if you, you, know, if you overdo it, you'll, you'll, you'll feel bloated and you don't want that to happen either. Um, so you're cooking all that for a while and then you take it off the stove when you're ready to eat it, throw in a couple sliced scallions. And if you like garlic, you could put a little bit of raw garlic in there. Why the scallions and garlic? So alliums, anything in the allium family, so that's onions, garlic, leeks, scallions, you know, all of those pungent herbs, which if you remember from my, my terrible drawing, uh, pungency is the flavor of the lungs. So we're working on the medical element, uh, metal element, excuse me, by adding in pungent flavored vegetables. And again, the research goes on and on and on. I'm not going to bother citing research, but I could pull out files, you know, big files worth of it on my computer. And I used to have them printed years ago before I had them on a, on a drive. Uh, but the allium family, besides having prebiotic chemicals, uh, sugars, also has really high, uh, is really high in volatile oils that are shown to be antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, antiparasitic. Garlic is like the miracle, you know, nature's antibiotic. In fact, I've, I've gotten rid of people, uh, let's see, there was, I remember I had one person with an acute bronchitis that I was able to cure with raw garlic instead of antibiotics. Um, so yay garlic. So when you're using those alliums though, you don't wanna cook those very much or at all actually, and you want to use them 
as you're going to eat them. So you chop it up, give it about 10 minutes of air exposure on your cutting board because that helps develop the chemicals. Then you throw it in your broth and then you eat it or drink it. Um, the final ingredient that I put in this, in this recipe that I love to make is a little bit of miso paste because we're making a little miso soup. And so now be careful because miso is really high in sodium, but what, what is the benefit to miso, if, especially if you're not cooking it, which you're not, you're just throwing it in at the end it's a natural fermented food. So it's fermented soybean that has live bacteria in it. And if you get a good quality miso, that is. Um, so you're again, enhancing your microbiome, which enhances immune function. So that's my, that's my little uh, mushroom broth soup. And uh, I have another thing I'm going to share with you. I'm gonna switch gears here. Uh, actually, before I go into that, one other thing. So where does the sweet come in uh, on that star that I drew? especially with relationship to this season, the fall season. And that is basically the answer is squash. So that's another thing we, we hear about all the wonderful, disgusting foods that we shouldn't eat, I should say. Lovely, but disgusting at the same time, like pumpkin pie and, and things like that. And people make squash that's laden with sugar and, and butter and all those just terrible things that are wonder, wonderful, but we shouldn't put too much in our body. But you can do things with, with those vegetables that are not full of fat and sugar and butter and appreciate the natural sugars that come out of them. So squash and greens, are the classic combination. Uh, right now we're at the very tail end of the green season. So when I go to the farm share, I could still get all kinds of kale and escarole and those bitter leafies. And you, I also see it next to my favorite thing, which is carnival squash. If you haven't tried carnival squash, I highly recommend it. Most people start, kind of stop at butternut squash and acorn squash, uh, but there's so many others that are, that are wonderful to eat. So the reason I like carnival squash is because it has a little bit of that sweetness like butternut squash, but a much lower glycemic index, much, much lower. Um, and acorn squash is also nice, but personally I think acorn squash often has very little flavor to it. And so that's why I like the uh, carnival because you still get a nice uh, profile of flavors in there. And so we're talking of the reason we like squash besides the fact that it's in season right now is on a biochemistry level, it's really rich in the beta carotene complex, complexes. And beta carotenes, of course, convert into something called vitamin A in the body. Um, and vitamin A is very much linked to our immune functioning. In fact, there's theories that a low vitamin A status can be linked to a whole host of autoimmune diseases. So um, we want to make sure that we're getting enough of these yellow and orange and red colored vegetables to keep our vitamin uh, beta carotene status and our vitamin A, A status up. What you might not think about for the carotenoid family, which that's all the carotenes, there's many of them actually, there's zeaxanthin, astaxanthin, lutein, lycopene, these are all a, a family of carotenoids, beta carotene and provitamin A, they're all in the same category. Um, they're not so difficult to get if you eat the rainbow like most of us teach in the nutritional uh, uh, medical nutrition industry. Um, the color that is important there is the oranges, of course, but yellows also have them. So there's, that's where all the squash family comes in. What you might not know is that greens, of course, our favorite vegetable in the world, leafy greens, are super rich in carotenoids. And the only reason that you don't make that association is because they're green. But if you are looking outside, now that we're starting to have the leaf colors uh, change, you'll notice that leaves typically turn to oranges, yellows, and reds as they die. And that's just because as the plant dies down, uh, dies back, the chlorophyll content goes down. So the green is actually just hiding the colors in the fall that we see. So the carotenoids that are orange and yellow in those leaves, you just can't see when they're, they're the leaves are really lush and healthy. Um, so of course, we wanna make sure we get our leafy greens in for that reason, for the carotenoid reason. A uh, secondary reason is that they're really, really rich in vitamin C, and you could often get more vitamin C out of leafy greens than you can out of things that are really high glycemic, like orange juice, which is a big no-no uh, in my book. I'm not a fan of orange juice, um, or many juices at all for that matter. Uh, so greens and squash, especially the more bitter greens with some of the less glycemic squash make a really nice pairing because you're talking about bitter being cut by the sweet flavor. Uh, and if you saute a whole bunch of things like garlic or ginger, which is the pungent flavor, you're now attacking one, several of those elements to bring those into your uh, diet, into your palate. Um, so summing it up really quickly on that is 
Don't forget your maitakis and shiitakes for your immune function. Don't forget to eat your greens. Don't forget to eat your squash and then low glycemic root vegetables. There's my uh, in the fall kind of sum it up nutritional advice. Another fun fact that uh, may or may not be practical, um, shiitake mushrooms um, actually can be very high in vitamin D. Um, and so there has been some talk about this in, around you know, the health food industry. Um, the reason that shiitakes can be rich in vitamin D is not because they're naturally vitamin D rich, but when they're dried specifically, if the grower harvests them and then when they dry them, they put them uh, the gills up facing the sun, the actual, the gill part of the mushroom can absorb sunlight and convert it into vitamin D. So of course the caveat is it's only, that's only true if you have the person drying the mushrooms the right way, or you could of course do that yourself if you have a good fresh source of shiitake. The reason I also mentioned that is because vitamin D is a really important nutrient for immune functioning. Uh, and is also linked to chronic autoimmune disease if, if the person is deficient. And so that is another thing to think about. I wanna show you a quick website um, that if you're curious about the nutritional, just vitamins, really simple research-based uh, website, the Linus Pauling, here it is, Linus Pauling Institute. Okay, there you go. You could very easily have fun surfing this website one vitamin at a time. And, you know, I was, I was thinking about what I was going to talk about on a nutritional level and my head started spinning because if I could pull, I could do a search for, you know, you could research nutrition and immune function. And what comes up is every vitamin under the sun. <laughs> so I started to think, oh my gosh, I got to teach about vitamin D and I've got to teach about the carotenoids and, and how they work and that they're chromophores. And, and so my head started spinning. I said, or I could just show you this and you guys could read on your own. Um, so there's the Oregon State University has a wonderful database on the Linus Pauling Institute. He was a, a nutritionist, a biochemist, a really uh, well-known person in uh, functional medicine. And so here's, this is a page on just on vitamin D and you could read all about the chemistry and some research, uh, synopsis of research on, there's a paragraph in there somewhere on immunity. Uh, then you could look up, the next one I have is on the car carotenoids, uh, which is the, the quote unquote fall nutrient because of the oranges and the orange color of things. You could always you know, look up vitamin C, right? We all know vitamin C for the, if you get a cold, take your vitamin C, you know, that's nice. Um, and let's see if it'll let me uh, scroll over. I found one Oops. on zinc. So our very good friend zinc. Zinc is uh, super important and everybody hears about zinc lozenges um, and that's nice. But the reality is in my practice, it's one of the most common deficiencies that I find on lab work if you do the right kind of lab work to know this. And zinc is a major mineral that is linked to so many different enzymatic reactions is actually something over 400 enzymatic reactions re uh, require zinc for them to happen properly in our body. Many of them being in white blood cell formation and uh, chemotaxis and all these other uh, big medical words that we don't need to go in. So you could read about that uh, and definitely make sure that you're trying to get some zinc sources of, your, of foods in your diet. And the information is there. Another really important one, oh, I can't see, gotta scroll up here is selenium. Uh, so really easy way to get selenium is eat four Brazil nuts a day. Uh, and then you can get your daily dose. Uh, of course, there are many other fo foods that do, well, not many, but there are definitely other foods that have uh, high amounts of selenium. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of mention those couple things, but like I said, you know, B vitamins are involved and magnesium is involved. And so all of these nutrients are involved. So when I thought about talking about nutrients, I, I realized because my head started spinning, I can't remember this study that was done. And I want to say it was in the, I want to say that it was in the mid nineties um, on lung cancer and the, the carotenes. So basically what they did was they gave a bunch of smokers uh, either carotene, a beta carotene or nothing. I think, I think that's how it went. And what they realized that actually the people that took high doses of beta carotene had a higher incidence of lung cancer. And the problem with that is they, they were giving actually not even beta carotene. It was a synthetic form of beta carotene. Uh, what the conclusion ended up being, you know, fast forward many years of research, if you give beta carotene alone, 
you absolutely do increase your risk of, of lung cancer. But if you give it in the context that it came in nature, like in squash, for example, uh, which is alpha, beta, delta, <laughs> uh, gamma carotene, uh, just like the vitamin E, you know, you have all these different subcategories you actually then, not only do you not have a higher incidence of cancer, but you lower the incidence of cancer. So the moral of the story is food is medicine and eat the vitamin in the context, in the, the natural media where it, it comes from. And maybe there's a place for supplements, but really food is the medicine, not beta carotene. So take your daily dose of squash, don't take your daily dose of vitamin A. You know, that's, that's the idea from that. So, um, that's why I decided not to go too much into the vitamins today, because I think you can go down a rabbit hole that it's easier to just eat the squash and greens, right? Saute your kale. You get a lot of nutrients in one dose of kale. So the last thing I want to show you, which is one of my other favorite things, and then I'll, we'll, we could talk if we have questions, um, is my favorite fall ritual, which is making fire cider. Has anybody heard of fire cider? Uh, let's see. So sharing my screen again. So I did a little kitchen project. I wanted to, we wanted to invite you into our kitchen today since it's a supper's meeting and we can't do it in real life. And that's so sad, but we'll get there one day. And I want to show you, can you still see me or you only yeah, seeing my- Yeah, no, we can see you. You see me? So here's what I did. We did this today. Wow. This was my excuse for getting my fire cider started. So we'll, <laughs> I'll show you the journey. Um, fire cider is actually this thing that kind of came out spontaneously by a well-known herbalist named Rosemary Gladstar, uh, you know, 30 years ago or something. And she, she's a famous herbalist who has a, an herbal medicine school. And one day she just kind of made it up with a bunch of her students. And it became so popular that every herbalist who knows anything about herbal medicine in America knows the term fire cider and usually has a practice of making their own. Essentially what the, the, the ingredients are, the original recipe was ginger, garlic, horseradish and onions, and you just chop them up, throw them in a bunch of apple cider vinegar, let it sit for a month. And then you have this wonderful elixir that's rich in chemicals that help fight off colds, boost your immunity, break up phlegm in the lungs and the sinuses and warm up the circulation. So that's essentially what you end up with. Oh, I'm sorry, and, and the chili peppers, those were in the, uh, the cayenne peppers, the original recipe. So there was this, this actually this thing that happened a couple, few years ago, maybe five years ago, that a, there was a company somewhere, I think a, maybe in New England, that tried to patent fire, fire cider. They were jarring it and they tried to do, apply for a patent. And of course, the herbal community was a, in a complete uprising as they're saying, how could you possibly patent something that belongs to the people? You know, the average person, this is a kitchen remedy. And so herbalists stand together and Rosemary Gladstar was definitely one of the people heading the movement. Uh, they won a, a federal court battle against this. And so fire cider cannot be patented. And of course, in response, and in also in order to pay some of the legal debt <laughs> that they needed to pay off, they came out with a book. Um, it's a beautiful book. And I'm happy plugging this book because I just think it's a great reference and a great thing to have. It's just a recipe book uh, about fire cider um, with several hundred recipes and variations of fire cider. So I think that's something, if you look up Rosemary Gladstar, it's a wonderful thing to buy um, and you'll have fun playing with some of the recipes. So one of the other things that I, I use all the time in my life is Thieves Essential Oil. Um, and I don't know, especially now with COVID, that's a big part of my life. So Thieves Essential Oil is uh, basically, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, cloves, eucalyptus, depending on the company you buy it from, either lemon or orange, um, and there's something else in there. Oh, rosemary. I believe those basic four ingredients makes up thieves, you know, essential oil recipe. And I use that stuff to, it's in my hand sanitizer. I clean my floors with it. I clean my doorknobs. It's all of my cleaning products have it um, because it's wonderfully non-toxic. But the reason that thieves is important, and this actually can be validated by research, is that it's incredibly rich in chemicals that are antiviral, antibacterial, and immune stimulating. Um, so for example, cloves are really rich in something called eugenol. And eugenol has a ton of research if you were to look that up, and it's E-U-G-E-N-O-L. I guess I could type that into the uh, chat. 
uh, when I can't when I stop sharing my screen because it won't let me right now. But uh, eugenol has a lot of research for that, uh, for killing off bacteria, parasites. They use it for um, you know in, in in Asia they've been using clove oil or clove extracts for killing off you know tapeworms in in children. So it's pretty powerful stuff. So the recipe that I made today was from one of Rosemary's book that I decided I wanted to play with, which is a thieves fire cider. So it's combining thieves concept and fire cider concept in one recipe. So I'm gonna take you through, my, my wonderful husband decided that it would be fun to photo document it. And then I have this wonderful thing to share with you. So the first ingredient is horseradish root. Um, and essentially in this jar, I used about if it were chopped up, I would say it would be about three quarters to a, a cup worth of chopped horseradish. And if you're making this recipe, you do not necessarily have to peel everything because number one, the skins and peels of fruits and vegetables are actually incredibly nutrient dense. So I really hate to lose it. And number two, you're going to eventually strain the uh, plant matter out of the vinegar and you're using just the vinegar. Um, so that's the part of the thieves vinegar. So I just used a section like this. So if I go back to the first picture, you see that was the whole root that I picked with the cutting board. So you can get a frame of reference for size of the root compared to those kind of, those were sort of medium red onions. I only used about a half of that root in the actual recipe. I cut off the end of it, which is the part that was just kind of really hard and dry, uh, the shriveled part. And I, I cut off any like really hard barky kind of knobs uh, from the skin, but that's basically, and then I sliced it up just so that it could go in my food processor and, and uh, puree easier. I sliced up the onions. Um, I use red onions because why use a white onion when you use a red onion? That's kind of like my motto. The purple in there is super rich in anti-cancer, anti-everything, antioxidants, like really wonderful compounds, just like blueberries and blackberries, rich in antioxidants. That's why the red onions are better. And in this recipe, I actually just took off the very outer layer of skin because they're sometimes sprayed with chemical, but the other skin I left on, the, the inner layers of skin, because that again, have nutrients. I have farm garlic from an organic farm. Uh, so I didn't even bother peeling these because I know they're, they're made and uh, harvested without any chemical process whatsoever. I just took off the little rootlets at the bottom and took the cloves out, threw them in the blender. I would say I used about two heads of two heads of garlic. Uh, ginger, I would say it was about the size of my palm of my hand, a nice big chunk. And again, I just, all I did was cut off the dry parts that were at the end of the root, but I left the skin on. Um, <laughs> Chili pepper, two cayenne peppers. The only part I took off, I just showed this picture because I just took off the green stem, but I used the entire thing, including the seeds. Uh, these are these are cayenne that I use got from the farm and dried myself. And those, that's my favorite thing to do every, you know, just like a, a true good Italian boy, you have to dry, get garlic and dry your cayenne peppers every, uh, every summer. So I got into that habit. Um, so that's the original ingredients. Then we have the thieves kind of element to it, which is rosemary. I took, uh, I would say, I think about four, three really long, six inch long sprigs of rosemary. And all I did was take out the center stem. Uh, I put two lemons and one orange. Please, please, please make sure that if you ever use citrus peel in anything, it is absolutely organic. That's number one. Citrus, because most people, most companies don't think we eat do much with the skins, they're very heavily sprayed. Even if they're organic, they're often sprayed in waxes to preserve them. So the other thing I want to encourage you to do is besides number one, make sure they're organic. Number two, use a something like Dr. Broner's liquid soap um, or a very good organic detergent to actually scrub, wash the peel with warm water to melt some of the waxes off to uh, keep those out of your body. You don't want the uh, those to, it disrupt your endocrine system. Um, the next ingredient, which is not in the original recipe, uh, but I think that it's really great stuff, is just simple garden oregano. So I took off a bunch of leaves of that. If I had my, I wanted to have sage in there, but basically Whole Foods was out. <laughs> so I didn't have sage. Uh, sage has some really good antibacterial properties and is really great, especially for sore throats. Oregano has a ton of antibacterial, antiviral properties. So it's a, it's a wonderful herb to be putting in, in this recipe. And then I put uh, black peppercorns, 
because black pepper increases absorption of other plant compounds in the gut. Uh, the cloves, because the uh, cloves are part of the traditional uh, thieves recipe and the eugenol content, which is also antibacterial. So I put about a tablespoon of black peppercorns and about 20 cloves. Those can get overpowering if you put too many. Uh, the star anise in the bottom is my addition just because I really love star anise because it helps with digestion. It also helps kind of coat the stomach a little bit so it can protect the stomach from all of these harsh ingredients. Uh, and then the thing at the top is actually rose hips that are uh, dried rose hips uh, and they're, they're chopped up. That's again, totally optional, but rose hips are a really great herbal medicine that is soothing to the gastric mucosa and super rich in vitamin C. So it fits nicely into the recipe. Um, and so basically I just threw everything in the, in the Ninja food processor, chopped the heck out of it, got it as small as I can get it because I could have better extraction into the vinegar. And then I threw in a, a brand who shall not be named organic apple cider vinegar with the mother. <laughs> I don't know who that could possibly be, what kind of brand that could be. Uh, I threw all the plant matter in there, filled the jar. And basically what I'm looking for is covering it with the vinegar plus about an inch. So you wanna have a lot of plant material in there. Um, and then next to that, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have this under my kitchen sink. So it's in a cool, uh, dark place. You don't, do not want light exposure. Uh, because the UV radiation from sun, even indoors, can degrade some of the medicinal plant chemicals that you want to keep in there. Uh, and about every day or two, I'm going to go in there and just give it a quick shake so that it can mix around the in the solution. I let it sit for about four to six weeks. So if you need it, a bit, now it's, I did it a little late, so it'll be about a month. And then when I take it out, I will strain it out and I will mix in this, which is Manuka honey. Um, you certainly could use a local honey. There are pros and cons to, are pros to both of them. The local honey is great because it has the net local pollen theory helping with allergies of our own environment, which honey from other areas will not do. But the Manuka honey I use uh, because there's a lot of research with it as antibacterial, antiviral remedy. So since I'm doing this as a uh, cold and flu prevention kind of tonic, I, I chose the Manuka honey. You don't add the honey until the vinegar is ready and it's steeped for the month. So you strain it out. And then in this, uh, this is, I guess, about a half, I think this is about a half gallon jar that I made. I'm only going to put about a cup of honey. For those of you who cannot use honey because of blood sugar issues, that is, you're totally, it's totally acceptable to leave it out. You do not have to use honey. It just adds another, a little bit of sweetness so that it's a little more palatable and another aspect of, of antibacterial uh, medicinal compounds. Um, but again, you could certainly leave it out. There's no harm in that. And uh, that's, that's me and my husband because uh, he inspired me. He took the picture, so I had to give him credit for something. <laughs> Uh, so how you use the vinegar, essentially the traditional is that you could take a little a one ounce shot of it every day. You could mix it into some water and just drink it as a, as a daily immune tonic. You could use it as a gargle. And if you're going to use it as a gargle for like preventing or, or curing strep throat, which I can't use the word cure. I'm sorry. Let me roll my eyes at that. Uh, for not, for not curing, but for helping the symptoms of strep throat, you put a little bit of it, like a tablespoon into some warm water and a little bit of salt so that you have that sodium solution. And then you could gargle with it up to every 30 minutes or even an hour, um, spitting it out, of course, because if you put the salt. Um, if you don't want to drink it because it's too harsh, it makes a great medicinal salad dressing. It's the most healthy salad dressing you could ever possibly imagine. Okay. Um, and you could also use it as a cooking ingredient. It's really, it's really great versatile stuff. There's tons of recipes online if you want to play with other ingredients. There's book recipes in the book. I highly recommend you get into your fall habit of making a batch that'll last the winter. We look forward to having you back, Andrew. This has been really, really informative, fun, and um, and thank and you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, everybody. Hope to see you at another event soon. Mm -hmm.